America produced more films in the 20th century than the rest of the world combined, and we have the worst rate of preservation and, and conservation. 50% of all films are already lost. If we're looking at the silent era, 90 to 95% are lost. And so even though this medium is relatively young, the losses are as great as antique pottery. 500 years from now, people will look back and they'll say, this was the beginning. This was the first 100 years. These were the origins. Why didn't they take better care of them? And the day they're talking about, it's us. I'm George Willeman, and I would like you to accompany me through a brief history of cinema. The history of American motion pictures really starts in the late 1880s when this New Jersey minister and inventor named Hannibal Goodwin comes up with the idea of adhering in a photographic emulsion to nitrate film. It turns out to be a really great medium for projecting images over and over again, but nitrate is also incredibly flammable and chemically unstable, so what didn't burn explosively tended to rot over the years. Despite its dangers, nitrate became the standard of the industry. The stuff burns furiously like gasoline-soaked rags, and even water can't put it out. Throughout the teens, there were enormous fires at film studios and storage companies, totally destroying vast amounts of the silent films of the era. In 1937, we had a huge loss when nearly the entire pre-1935 Fox catalog was destroyed in a vault fire in New Jersey. 40,000 cans of film burned. One of the films was the great Theda Berra epic, Cleopatra. In addition to accidents, the studios were destroying their films deliberately for their silver content. They figured nobody was ever going to want to see these old films again. In 1959, the company that bought RKO Pictures ordered many of those films to be tossed into the Santa Monica Bay. There's even a handwritten note that just says, dump them. One of the things that is probably prevalent uh, in the lives of a lot of people who work with film is the habit of keeping fragments. When films would have to be discarded for whatever reason, I just got it into my mind that it would be nice to keep a little piece of it to show people in the future this is what it actually looks like. Um, for example, this, this is a little tiny piece of film from 1905. It's actually a title off of a Vitagraph film called Burglar Bill and How He Lost His Tooth by Mistake. My name is Liz Stanley. I'm a film archivist at the Library of Congress. The process of inspection starts off pretty simply with opening the can to see what's inside. If it's in good enough shape to be removed from the can, you begin slowly winding through it to see what you have. Hey, let's stop here and see where we are in this film. Let's see what we have on the film. Okay. In the late 1890s, the nitrocellulose film was developed. After a lot of, you know, starts and stops, they finally get this 35 millimeter film stock and they start making films on it. The major problem with nitrate is that it is very flammable. And when I say very flammable, I mean it is very flammable. It'll burn very fast and once it starts burning, you cannot put it out. The other reason a lot of them don't survive, of course, is just because the studios didn't really care about them. They were just product, and once they were done and made their money, they went on the shelf. MGM had all its films stored on its lot in concrete bunkers. No air conditioning in those days, and uh, I found in going out in the summertime it was over 125 degrees in those bunkers. And it occurred to me that that might not be good for the film. Why had that not occurred to anybody else? I haven't the slightest idea. 
they discovered in the 40s, you have this film stock tends to break down and deteriorate. The nitric acid begins to leach out of the film. It creates a, a very strong gas. And if the film is in a can, of course, the gas just kind of sits in there and it kind of stews in its own juices. Pew. Little, they look like little droplets of honey will begin to squeeze up from between the wraps of the film. And then those begin to harden into a crust and then the film breaks down into a fine brown powder and that's all she wrote. Film is the language of our time. So you've got music, you've got dialogue, you've got physical bodies moving. I found the place where all the arts came together. Well, film is the most democratic art form ever created. Films are for everybody. If you look at original nitrate print, the term the silver screen had a real meaning because that surface emulsion layer on film is pure silver. Uh, I first saw nitrate films actually when I was in film school. And there's so much sparkle. People don't know what they're missing. They don't know. If you haven't seen a nitrate film, uh, there is so much sparkle coming off the screen you almost want to wear sunglasses. It is astounding. I think when they were shooting uh, nitrate film in the beginning, they didn't know that 10, 15, 20 years later, it was gonna blow up. It's true, all these, these films, they are like the polar ice caps. They're vanishing fast. We're playing beat the clock here. And you never know, you know where the next find is gonna come from. Well, Dawson City is an unusual place. From its inception, it was always the end of the road. It's a long way away from anywhere else. When films were distributed to Dawson City to be shown in the theaters here, there was no incentive for them to be returned. It was too costly. And it's behind this building that the story of the Dawson Film Find begins. The Dawson City collection is very unusual. There was an old skating rink in Dawson City that was torn down. They were going to build something new there. They started excavating the basement and began to find all of these cans of film buried under the ground. It was those reels of movie film that I started to examine. I picked some of them up and looked at them at the site. And out of curiosity, I tested some of them to see whether or not they were the old nitrate stock. And that was confirmed when I lit a match to a small length of film. It immediately went off like a rocket flare. So we set up an operation in there where we could identify the contents in the film. There were some names that even I recognized. And one was uh, John Barrymore, another was Douglas Fairbanks the crew that was hired by the museum compiled a list. And we had a list of over 400 reels of film. This was a big find. This was one of the biggest single finds of, the, of that time, all dating from the teens and early 20s. And most of them, a good portion of them, being films that did not exist in any other format anywhere. And this is something that happens a lot, actually. This is where a lot of our film heritage comes from. If they stayed in this country quite often, more often than not, they were dumped off the Santa Monica Pier. Overseas, the films, perhaps because of the bureaucracies of those countries, they just would put them in a room. They wouldn't throw them away. And so many American films have been discovered, found in uh, Czechoslovakian, Russian, and Bulgarian vaults. So it's ironic that as much as our culture has been spread around the world, it's like we're now trying to retrieve it and some of the only prints in existence, particularly a lot of nitrate uh, prints, are sitting in another country. About 10 years ago, I was lucky enough to go to the National Film Archive in Prague, in the Czech Republic. And just as I was packing up my stuff to go, uh, Veroslav Haba, who had been helping me out, said, well, don't you want to look at this other film you requested? And I said, what film? And we looked, and in the corner of the room there were about uh, eight very rusty cans of nitrate film. 
and we took out the first reel of the film. I said, what is this film? He said, well, I think it's called Her Wild Oat. I said, I haven't heard of that film. And he said, no, I don't think that anybody else has it. The wonderful thing here, of course, is this is a Colleen Moore film. And there are a few of her films that survive, but many of them are lost. She became uh, absolutely synonymous with the flapper. I talked to several people at a couple of different archives. We checked and found out, indeed, that no other archive, no other private individual was known to have a copy of this film, Her Wild Oat. About two years later, in the middle of the night, something like 2 a.m., I woke up in a cold sweat. I thought to myself, there is an unrestored, lost Colleen Moore film in Prague, and nobody is doing anything about it. It turns out that it is very difficult to arrange for a highly flammable, possibly explosive nitrate print to be shipped from Prague to America. After about four months' time, we were finally able to complete the arrangements. The original nitrate film was shipped to America where it was sent into the film lab and it is restored now and you can see it and it's a terrific comedy a charming little sort of proto screwball comedy if you will i've had a little chance in my small way to have a discovery i get to feel for a second like i'm indiana jones uncovering lost treasures film is the art form of the 20th century and we have let it go. The studios stored the films badly, and, and they deteriorated, they burned. They didn't think of them as an art form. If I loved The Wizard of Oz, or Gone with the Wind, or Singing in the Rain, and it was finished with theatrical distribution throughout the world, what was to become of it? The answer was nothing, but at least for God's sake, preserve it. Back at the beginning of my career, I was an intern at George Eastman House in Rochester, New York. We got a call from MGM, and at that time, they decided that they didn't need their nitrate anymore, and they were gonna dump it into the ocean. So my director, uh, James Carr, said, we'll take it. So a week later, at two o'clock in the morning, I get a call, get down to the vaults, because a semi-tractor trailer had pulled up filled with nitrate film, Technicolor negatives, from Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, Meet Me in St. Louis. Every famous MGM Technicolor film was there, including all the cartoons, everything. MGM, 10 years later, calls up and says, well, we need access to the, to the nitrate because we realize the preservation work we had done isn't good enough. Preservation is really the um, taking of a particular film and moving it to a more stable format. So whether the film is nitrate, which is flammable, that's absolutely a very bad idea in terms of long-term preservation. So the goal there would be to move it to a safety film stock, a modern film stock. And that's really just moving from one kind of material to another. Um, restoration is a larger project. It's really bringing something back to the way it was when it was first seen. Restoring film is not sending in a lab order, saying here's a negative, make a print for me. It's archeology, span it's digging through the vaults, it's trying to figure out how they were made. We, we have a phrase, cinematographers have a phrase, we, we, we say, we wanna preserve all films at opening day quality. So we want you to see this picture looking just like it looked on opening day. You know what? That's not an unreasonable thing. You have to go down to the foundation of the film. You go to the original negative. An original camera negative is the piece of film that was in the camera the day that the shot was made. And after it runs through the camera, it goes to a laboratory, gets processed, and then to view it, you have to make a positive print from that negative. You try and find your finest surviving elements, which may be a negative, it may be a print, and you extract bits and pieces of all of those elements and put them together again and you can recreate a new digital negative and that's where digital comes into play. 
you scan it into a computer and we basically go in and we take out the, the dirt, scratches, uh, splice marks, any kind of artifacts and, and clean up the picture so it looks as good as the day it was shot. Celluloid, unfortunately, is not the world's strongest material. Therefore, motion picture film must be handled with care to protect it from damage. You see what I mean? Working in film preservation, I really was exposed to how fragile and delicate film is, how easy it is to ruin an image just by scratching it. Any friction against the surface of moving film is likely to produce a scratch. It shows on the screen as a dark vertical line, like this, and this, and this. If at all possible, we try to remove defects like that. That's where digital tools come in handy because you can literally, like a paintbrush, just erase them and they're gone. Hey there. Get your fingers off the film. That's better. Sometimes the ethics come up as to what are we doing with this person's film? Are we actually changing it? Are we changing the look the way that they meant it to be? What, uh, what are we doing with this film? Why are you touching this film? And, and, and our intent always from day one is to go in and not change it, but make it as good as the director intended it to be. All Quiet on the Western Front, Lewis Milestone's great, great anti-war film. Just an astonishingly great work of art. There was a longtime staff member here, now retired, David Parker, who worked on that film virtually all of his life, looking for the missing pieces because pieces were cut out to shorten it and re edit it, and they were thrown away. And so he sort of made it a habit to try to find all extant copies in the world and try to find even a few frames here and there that might have survived so that they could be restored back to a final version approximating what people saw at the time. And he was able to do that. And it now survives and is extremely powerful. It would have been forgotten. And, and, and now when people see it, at the end in particular, where you have, without sound, a long line of soldiers who've been killed throughout the movie, looking back at the camera as they march away into oblivion, set against a huge hillside of crosses, of graves just going on and on and on. And it's an extraordinarily powerful ending. But that was cut, that was changed when that movie was released. One thing people forget about when they think about film, of course, is that we have newsreels, too. And newsreels are just wonderful documents of the past. Hello, everyone. This is Edwin C. Hill speaking, globetrotter for Hearst Metrotone News. We have the whole newsreel from 1916 to 1972, not only the actual newsreels, but all the outtakes. And it's the outtakes in particular that are so interesting. We are grateful to Mary and Miss Marion Anderson for coming here to sing to us today. Marion Anderson was a very famous opera singer who in 1939 was asked to perform at uh, Constitution Hall and was barred by the Daughters of the American Revolution from entering the building because she was African-American. So Eleanor Roosevelt invited her to sing on the Washington Mall. Tens of thousands of people showed up on Easter Sunday, 1939, to hear her sing. And that is, by many historians, considered the very first moment of the Civil Rights Movement. And we not only have the, the 30 seconds that was in the newsreel, and ironically of those 30 seconds, 20 seconds is a white guy introducing her, but we have almost all of the footage of the actual concert. So we've taken that footage now and put it together to actually reconstruct that concert because it was such an important event to the history of, of our country and especially the history of race relations.
There is, out in the world, not among professionals, but among ordinary people, there is, I think, the general notion that not only has every been, everything been preserved, but it's all available on the internet or on DVD through Netflix or whatever. Even though there might be 40 or 50,000 DVDs out there, this is only a very, very small proportion of all the films that have been produced. Media is fragile. Film is fragile. It doesn't last forever. Videotape is even more fragile. And digital bits. I mean, you know, we haven't figured out a way to save digital bits beyond a few years. If you collect material that's digital, you have to keep migrating to the next generation carrier. You know, what, what happens to all your floppy disks right now? What happens to your zip drives? So by its very nature, moving images and all sort of time-based media are indeed ephemeral. Of course, we had 35 millimeter film we've had for 115 years. We've had digitality now for maybe, let's stretch it, 20 years. In 20 years, we've gone through 30 different formats. So every 18 months, the industry is creating new formats that are incompatible with the previous formats. What we discovered is that huge amounts of materials would be copied to digital formats and then discarded with the belief that the digital copies would last forever. And that's not the case. Think of the hard drive in your computer or a DVD or CDs that you have and how fragile they are. Uh, and how they can fail and you can lose data and how anybody who works with computers always advises people to back up their content and so on and things that we all hardly ever do. So we do use digital technologies but it's with great care. Digital is part of the problem now that it's not part of the solution. We're still preserving films on film because film is going to last so much longer um, and be useful for so much longer than any digital file will be. Acetate, or better, better said, polyester film, which is what we use these days in the analog world, if it is stored properly, cold and dry, we know through tests that have been done, it will last 500, 600, 700 years, maybe longer, through nothing but passive storage. Very cold, very dry, put it on the shelf, and we know we can go in a couple hundred years and pull it out, and it'll still look good. A lot of the films will be lost forever, despite all of the best efforts. So many are gone. So I think Martin Scorsese once said, so much of film history has already been lost, but there's still a very great deal which can be saved if we're willing to do it. So in whatever way possible, we have to attend to preserving things as much as possible now. I think that decay is a natural part of life loss is going to be an inevitable part of our social process. And for me, an important part of our work is selection, a careful choice as to what we work on and how we work on it. History requires human beings to take care of it. History doesn't take care of itself. Sheltering history is a temporary responsibility because our, our time on the world is temporary. But, but artifacts often outlive human beings. And the Library of Congress is over 200 years old and it is filled with works of history and art and culture that, that have been cared for by generations of archivists before us and by generations who will come after us. One of the important things about preserving movies is getting them out there in various forms so that a new generation can discover them and then they'll say, I don't want that to disappear. There's something to be said for sharing an experience with, with a room full of people. To all laugh at the same thing or, or cry at the same thing, it's, it's a different experience than watching it at home. My all-time favorite movie is Casablanca. I saw it when I was in my mid-teens. I was lucky enough to see it in a theater with a packed audience on a big screen, not on television, not on a home video device. And seeing it that way at an impressionable time in my life, it just blew me away. The 
film takes place in a two-hour space, but is it limited to that space? When you walk out of the theater, what do you carry with you? If you are touched by it and you have lived, in a sense, those two hours in that film, when you come out, you're changed in a way. Right? The world looks different to you. We should preserve films for reasons that we know and reasons that we don't know. We should preserve films because we're preserving art. We should preserve films because we're preserving culture. And we should preserve films because we have absolutely no idea what the future will value. If we're going to have a future to American culture, it's going to have to have some real relationship to past American culture. Just making sure that those images are around for you know, generations after I'm gone is very, very exciting to me.